Hey guys, welcome. In this video, we're gonna break down the four ways that you can animate your 2D characters in Unity. So by the end of this video, you're gonna know all of the pros and all of the cons of all of the 2D animation tools at your disposal and when you're gonna to wanna to use which. Ready? Let's go. So we're starting with probably the most common method that you're gonna see everywhere on the internet, and that is frame by frame sprite sheet animations. And I suspect this is the most common because it's the easiest from a technical standpoint to implement. And it's the only method of animation for traditional pixel art. And this is because on the Unity side of things, the animating is already done for you. And just by the way, I'm gonna leave links to all of the free art that you see in this video in the description in case you want to use them and play around with them. But literally sprite sheets are just text textures that contain multiple sprites like this one. And if you do happen to have all of your sprites separate and you need them combined in an easy way, I would recommend this website here. Link is down below in the description, which is gonna put it all together for you really easily. So from this point, you're going to slice it up in the sprite editor, usually by cell count or by cell size, if you know the dimensions works best. And then you can literally just drag and drop all of the different sprites of a certain animation cycle that you need into the hierarchy. And just like that, automatically an animator controller and animation file were created for you. The animation might be a little bit fast for your liking. So in the animation window, you can decrease the samples to slow the frames per second for this animation. And for the rest of the animations, you basically just rinse and repeat this process. Keeping in mind that the dragging and dropping method is gonna create a new game object in the hierarchy each time and a new animator controller each time, which we don't need. So I'll just get rid of those. And for animations that are this simple, we don't necessarily need the complexity of the animator if we don't want it. You certainly can use it, but for every transition that you set up, you're gonna have to uncheck has exit time and set the transition duration to zero. What a transition does behind the scenes is a blending of the two animations over a certain amount of time. This is frame by frame animation. We don't want blending here. So for something like this, this is potentially a great candidate for just foregoing the animator entirely. You still need your animation clips in here, but we could just play our clips directly using code, avoiding the need to set up custom animation transition logic in the animator, and then still having to code when those transitions trigger with code. But keep in mind, the more animations that you have, the more complex this would get. And so you'd likely need some way to keep track of your transition logic in code as things get more complex than this. This is just a really simple example. And again, if you like the animator, you can totally use it. There's nothing wrong with it. This is just another option that you have at your disposal. So with this, you get a lot of creative control. If you can draw or if you have an artist on your team, there are no limitations for you. And frame by frame isn't just for pixel art either. You can take Hollow Knight, for example. Like if you look at the false knight boss, he's got a very awkward body size, tiny stumpy legs that bend and straighten. The blur on his weapon is built right into the art. Animating this guy any other way would be next to impossible. And if you look at other characters like the broken vessel, he's got sword slashes and impact particles built right in too. So lining all of those things up and syncing them into your animations is gonna be really easy this way. So there is a lot of artistic work up front, but once that's done, you have everything you need in the engine and all you need to do is set up the transition logic. This is how Hollow Knight had such expressive characters, frame by frame animation. But obviously this method is a lot of work for the artist up front. You're gonna need multiple animations per character. And if you're making a top-down game, you're going to need to do every animation in three separate directions, which is a lot of drawing. And if you're not already experienced, 2D animation is difficult to learn and to get right. There are a lot of principles that need to be followed to get it right. But on the technical engine and code side of things, again, this is really easy and really straightforward to implement. And because of how difficult good 2D art is to learn and apply to your games, I'm so grateful to talk about today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is the largest online learning community offering thousands of classes across game development, illustration, graphic design, music, productivity, programming, and just about anything that you can think of. There's classes for all skill levels, so whether you're learning the absolute basics or you're just looking to refine your skills, there's a class for you. And their hands-on learning approach lets you apply what you've learned immediately, then share your work and receive feedback from the community. Plus, all classes are led by industry experts and available on demand so you can learn at your own pace, no matter what your schedule is like or what skill level you're at. One class I really appreciate is Pixel Art Mastery for video games. 
This is an extremely thorough class that covers everything you need to know about making pixel art, including color theory, color palettes, how to make characters, backgrounds, items, and animations. There's also a part two and three if you want to get into more advanced techniques. And this is just one example. There are so many game development art related classes on Skillshare from learning how to design tile sets to creating memorable characters. So if you're ready to take your game dev skills to the next level, then check out the link in the description to get started. The first 500 people that use that link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare just so that you can see if it's a good fit for you. Okay, so the second animation method is animating layered sprites. For the import process, you can use one .psb file from Photoshop, which is nice because it lets you keep all the layers and positions and rotations from Photoshop. But you can also just use multiple PNG files and layer them yourself from the ground up if you want to do it that way. But one of the most important steps here is the pivot points. And if you don't understand what pivot points do, you will in about five seconds. So right now on this arm with the pivot point in the center, if I scale it up and down, it uniformly scales it from the center. And if we rotate it again, it rotates it from the center point. But we want to rotate this from the shoulder, not from the center. So I'll bring the pivot point up. And now if we scale it, you can see it scales from the shoulder. And if we rotate it, it rotates it more realistically from the shoulder, which will make animating his arms a lot easier. So for this guy, I just have separate sprites for each body part. So I'm just going to bring those in. I'll bring in his torso and make his head and arms children of the body. And then I'll bring in the legs separately. How you layer each of your characters, it's going to depend on what you want to move and scale in your animation. For example, when I animate this guy, I want to be able to bring his upper body up and down just slightly while he's running without moving the legs because that would look weird. So I'm not parenting the legs to the torso. Now the layer orders are all weird right now. So again, for your characters, the order is going to depend on your character and his facing direction. I want the body here and I want the head on top of the body. The left arm can be literally behind everything. And I want the right arm to be on top of everything, even the head if he rotates it enough. And I want the legs behind the torso, but ensuring that the right leg is on top of the left leg. Now, animating a character like this, it's really not too bad. It's obviously more work than just dragging and dropping from a sprite sheet. And again, when I say that, I'm just talking about the Unity side of things because I know how much work frame by frame animation is for the artist. So I'll quickly show you how we might make a run cycle for this guy. I'll start by splitting the legs and the opposite arm as the leg is gonna come forward, so I'm gonna split the arms as well. I'm gonna call frame 20 our midpoint, and there I'm just gonna flip the legs in the other direction, same with the arms. And then just copy and paste the beginning frames as our end frames. Now that's looking pretty flat. So at frame five, our left foot has made contact with the ground and we're putting weight on it, so we can move the body down just a little bit. And at frame 15, his left foot is all the way back up, and so he's at his highest point in the walk. So we can raise his body up just slightly. And we can copy and paste those over here. And you can see just with that little change how much of a difference it makes. We can also squash the head slightly on the down pose and stretch it a little bit on the up pose. I'm gonna do the same with the torso, but I'm using height and width here because if I use scale, it's gonna do it to all the child objects, which I don't want. And there you go, that's a simple walk cycle. So with a simple character like this with half a dozen body parts, animating it, it's still pretty quick, pretty easy, and obviously way less work artistically. You only have to draw the character once in Photoshop or GIMP or Krita or whatever you use, and then you can build all the animations that you need in Engine. But you don't get quite as much room for the expressiveness that you can get with frame-by-frame -frame animation. We talked about the false knight, and now that we've made an example, I'm sure you can imagine how bad this guy's animations would have looked if we were using keyframe animations on each of these separate body parts. You're limited to just position, rotation, and scale. And as you can tell, it doesn't take much to get a decent looking animation done, but it is a lot more limiting. The pro is you get these nice, smooth 60 frame per second animations. And with this type of animation, you can make use of what the animator is great at, which is blending. You can see I set up a simple idle animation here as well. And in my animator, I've just set up a transition from idle to walk. And whether or not you use exit time, you have this transition duration here. And you can see as we go from idle to walk, it smoothly blends from one into the other. So you don't have to have any of that harsh snapping from one animation to the next, unless that's something you explicitly want by setting this to zero. 
And this leads us to our third method of animating, which is rigged animation. And these are gonna happen with .psb files because you need all of your different body parts in one file. So if we select use layer group and use as rig here, that's gonna bring in the sprite the way that it looks in our Photoshop file along with all of the layers as well. So if we go to the sprite editor and the skinning editor, this is where all of the magic is gonna happen. And I'm not gonna do a full animation on her because she has a lot of different body parts, but I'll show you a quick example of what you can do. I'm gonna add some bones to her hair. And so if I just double click her hair, it's just gonna select that sprite and I'll go to auto weights, click associate bone and click generate. And if you don't know what's going on here, what we're doing is we're using the mesh data of this 2D sprite and associating a certain weight per vertex for each of the bones. And you can see which part of the mesh is associated with which bone based on the color. And now as we rotate or move the bones, even though this piece of hair is just one sprite, we can bend it, we can stretch it, and if you got your weights right, it's gonna look quite natural if you don't go too crazy. And to add the bones into the scene, we go to our sprite and add a sprite skin and click create bones. And now the bones that we set up are accessible to us when we're creating our animation clips like we did with the last method. Before, we were limited to just position, rotation, and scale of each of the sprites. Now we can actually stretch and bend and warp different body parts, so this method gives us a lot more freedom. The only trade-off being it's a lot more work up front than the last method, and if you have really complex characters, getting a full rig that's properly weighted is going to take some time. So I definitely would not recommend this method for a game jam or anything where you're trying to get up and running really quickly. Now, the last method of animation is really more of a bonus because you can't fully animate a character with this method. It's really meant to be used as a bit of extra flair to your animations or to add customization options. And we do this by utilizing the power of the sprite library to let us easily swap sprites. How do you make your character blink or change facial expressions? How do you make swapping between multiple character variants really easy? How do you change your character's hand sprite at the right time so he can turn or grab things in a way that looks natural? This is where the sprite library comes in. Now, swapping sprites in the actual animation window can be done. That's totally fine. That's all sprite sheet animations are, actually. Your sprite renderer is just changing sprites really fast to give the illusion of movement. But if you start doing anything even remotely complex, it starts to break down and it gets really confusing and complicated. Now, with the sprite libraries, you can get really complex with it, but I'll show you a really basic example. For our little guy over here, I'm going to add a sprite library component and create a new sprite library. I'm gonna make a category called head, and I'm gonna add two options in here, a normal head and a blink head. And we can just drag and drop those sprites in there. Now we need to add a sprite resolver component on the object that holds our head sprite. And we select the right category, and you can see how the swap looks just by clicking on each one. Now you can swap things manually yourself in code by using the sprite resolver dot set category and label method. You just pass in the category and label as strings. Or another alternative for something like this where he's blinking, I could create a new little animation of him doing that. And then if I add a new animation layer and set it to additive, meaning this does not override anything, it's simply added on top of everything else. Now we're gonna have this little blinking animation on top of every other animation you make, which I think is really cool. And I want to be clear, from a technical standpoint, you are not just limited to one of these methods for your characters. You could use all four different methods of animation on a single character if you wanted. Now, from an artistic perspective, you want to make sure that you're keeping things cohesive in your game, so you probably don't want some enemies using sprite chain animations and some using a smooth 60 frame per second rigged animation. That's kind of illusion breaking, so just keep that in mind. So with this, I hope you have a better understanding of all the different ways that you can animate your 2D characters. I'll see you next week, guys.